question of seeking out infraction. You know, where did you fail? You know, what did you do wrong? What were you not good at? What can you improve on? So you take a 360, and everybody goes past the strengths pages faster than, you know, bourbon down my throat. <laughs> did that come out? <laughs> um, and we go straight on to the euphemistically called opportunities. You notice that? Uh, weaknesses are called opportunities. Um, and what we're, what we're doing is we're bringing people in and spanking them, you know, and, and uh, we're saying you've got to fix this, you better get better, get better at that. Because HR makes sure we don't use that terminology. It's all heavy dippy positive stuff. Uh, I need to be very careful. I like HR people a lot. I don't want to categorize them as anything. What we really got to do here is shift performance assessment to focusing on successes. What did you do right? And how can we bottle that in the organization? Not just what did you do right so that, you know, hey, we all think you're great. That's, that's good in its own. And celebration as part of the performance assessment process is, is, is important. And as with so much of this stuff, it's and, not or. We don't drop off um, consequence for failure. We don't drop off that if you get something wrong, you need to get it right. We don't drop off that if you've got a weakness, you've got to fix it. But we've got to add to it. If you did something right, if you hit the, the ball in the park with your sales figure last quarter, why? How? Do you understand it? I mean, I'm amazed at the number of times I talk to people who are running divisions, departments, projects or groups, and organizations in Treadmill, and I ask them about who they spend time with on their team, and they say, oh, spend endless time with this guy, this guy, this guy, who's not doing a really very good job trying to get them, you know, up to scratch. How much time do you spend with your superstars? None. Why do I shoot? They're superstars. Well, because you want to know why. You want to know how, and you want to milk it out through the rest of the organization. You want to find out how to bottle it and put it out there. So adding the success side to performance assessment as well is very important. One of the things that really helps that work well is providing good mentoring and coaching. Uh, I don't mean just a formal mentoring and coaching program, but essentially allowing people to make mistakes. One of the things that happens in Treadmill is because we're so compliance oriented, because we're telling people comply, comply, get things right, fix the checklist, get, you know, fulfill the systems and process, is that people are scared to make mistakes. They don't have an opportunity to make mistakes. So you need to have a mentoring and more particularly a coaching program where you can get people off to one side and they like going out in the driving range. I mean, who's going to try to fix their golf swing on the back nine of the masters? Uh, it's not the time to start experimenting. You want to get on the driving range, get out there with your with your coach and hit 100, 200, 500 balls. And you need a good mentoring and coaching program in order for people to relearn how to take risk. This is what we're trying to do. How to show, you teaching people how to relearn how to show creativity and initiative, then that could go wrong, right? I could show some initiative and get the wrong answer. I could try to be creative and this could go wrong. So I need an environment where I can try things out. So what I recommend is that people build a mentoring or coaching program where their mentor or coach is not the, anyone who's directly in the chain of their performance assessment. So that there's no fear of being dinged if they get something wrong. And this is one of the great things that GE did for many, many years. I mean, they've got their um, training at Groton. They've got superb mentoring and coaching. And they let you go and try and experiment things. And somebody will give you feedback as to whether it will work or not. And you get lots of opportunity to try stuff out. And usually, again, this is the same as here. I'm not saying every organization in Treadmill has got this all wrong, but it's good to get the chronology of it right and to work through them one at a time. <coughs> the final part is the training function, which again usually has become just that training, and it's usually around compliance. Uh, it's either mechanistic and functional, here's how to use all those notes in our organization, or it's compliance uh, based, here's how not to get you know, OSHA on our back, or you know, how not to screw up on quality control or something like that. And those are all good, they need to be there, but we need to add to them the development side. We need to talk as much about development as we need to talk about training. And that means getting senior executives involved, it means putting uh, stuff in there that's motivational, aspirational. It means getting the training function to help people, not just with their skill set, but with their attitudes and their personal development. It means that often, sometimes in a, in a organization in, in uh, treadmill, and I don't say this to be detrimental to anybody or any function, but sometimes it means moving an HR person away because they see the training function as an HR compliance activity. And bringing somebody in who's maybe a little bit from, uh, from uh, left field, who sees training and development more about developing the individual. Now, there are, I will say this, um, 
but in my own experience, categorically, there are many, many, many brilliant HR people who can do that. But just sometimes you get an HR professional who sees training and development as being a very, very rigid compliance-based thing, and that's not good for getting yourself out of trouble. And if the, these five work together again, again, the same thing happens that we talked about before. We get ownership and self-accountability comes back into the organization because of these things. I've been hired in because I've got an ability to be creative, social initiative, take risks. So I'm going to want to uh, aspire in the organization. I'm going to want to develop. I'm going to, I'm going to want to use those skills. You're helping me by telling me what I'm doing right as well as what I'm doing wrong. You're moving me about the organization, through the organization, so I'm seeing different aspects of it, bringing fresh eyes to it. You're getting me mentoring and coaching so I can take risks. And when I go in to get trained, I'm not just told how to comply, I'm told how to develop within the organization. You give me that, I'll respond with ownership and self-accountability. So those two sets are 60 to 70 percent of what most organizations need to look at in order to move either from whitewater into predictable success or from treadmill back into predictable success. There's another 20 to 30 percent which uh, is always uh, idiosyncratic and unique to the organization itself. Um, we're coming to the close of our time. I think I've got we have time for two questions. Just, just a couple questions, yeah. Um, sorry that I've stolen time. Then you got questions. Sorry. Let's take two questions. Can you move us quickly from what back back up away? Decapitate. That's the one. I've never in my experience I'm not saying it can't be done, I can only pass on my experience. I've never succeeded in them. You decapitate them or it doesn't happen. Because you've lost the power to self diagnose. And again, I, I don't know if there's anybody from Microsoft here, I don't know, I'm not going to be, I'm not trying to be detrimental, I just think it's so obvious. Um, the board at Microsoft have a choice. They need to get Bauer out, or they're going into the big one. I give them probably nine months. And, and see, Bauer's probably a lovely guy. I don't think that's a. One more. We're done. Thank you.